It's a great honor to be here in Greece, which is, to all intents and purposes, the birthplace of Western medicine. And in fact, when I graduated from medical school, I took a Hippocratic Oath. When I was in neuroanatomy class, I learned about the great vein of Galen. But something has happened recently. And during the economic crisis, a number of things actually happened to the Greek healthcare system. And in fact, one of the results of the austerity measures that were taken was this. There was a decreased investment in Greek healthcare. And in fact, Greek investment per capita in its healthcare system dropped to one of its lowest levels ever. It dropped, in fact, by half. And that funding for public health affected not only supplies and hospitals, but it actually affected personnel. And it happened all over the European Union. In fact, if you follow this story, what happened was that the lack of investment in healthcare drove a lot of physicians and nurses to actually leave many countries in the EU to look for higher paying jobs, jobs that would pay them a living wage elsewhere. And so there was a lot of brain drain of Greek physicians who were incredibly well trained to places like England and Germany. And in fact, you lost in the last decade about 60 physicians per 100,000 people. So what are we going to do, actually, to restore Greek healthcare to its pre-crisis days? This requires a paradigm shift. And in order to make paradigm shifts, you actually have to think differently. Uh, so this is what we're going to think about. I know this seems crazy. Why is she showing me a picture of space? This is why I'm showing you a picture of space. Believe it or not, it's actually quite hard to start an IV and draw your own blood while you're floating in microgravity. It's also hard to do chest compressions on a patient who might die otherwise without them. In fact, if you press on someone's chest, you'll go floating away. So you have to anchor yourself to some object. In other words, medicine in space is hard. Medicine in space is hard because it's under-resourced. We don't have sufficient medical expertise in space. We don't have a good supply chain in space. There are a lot of difficulties, and we can learn something from those lessons. So another way to look at paradigm shifting is to figure out what's going to spur the greatest innovation. So we don't just look to other examples, we look to new innovation. Now this afternoon, you're going to hear a lot about the XPRIZE, but I'm going to tell you that in the medical sector, the XPRIZE has been incredibly beneficial in spurring medical innovation. In fact, there have been two XPRIZES so far in the healthcare sector that have actually spurred incredible medical innovations. And most of them have been in this realm, in point of care diagnostics. And this team, which actually won the tricorder Qualcomm X Prize, it was one of two teams, actually is comprised of Greek American physicians. And this team actually won the Nokia Sensing X Prize. And what they were able to do is to create a platform in which a drop of blood at the point that that drop of blood was taken could be analyzed for all sorts of metabolites, electrolytes. And this is new. This is revolutionary. And just recently, I mean, look at the date. We have been actually finding new ways to diagnose using a drop of blood who is going to develop Alzheimer's disease? How, how many of you think that you're going to live to about 80? Raise your hands. I, I'm hoping that's most of this audience. OK, now what I want you to do is turn and look at the person next to you. And I want you to ask yourself which one of you is going to develop Alzheimer's disease. That, that's what's happening, right? We have an aging population, right? cancer, Alzheimer's disease, we need better diagnostics, and I hope to convince you that we also need new treatments and cures. Here's another one, right? This was just published last week, coming out of Brigham and Women's Hospital, using some nanotech, a smartphone, 3D printer, 
new diagnostic for HIV testing on the spot with reagents that cost less than five US dollars. This, this is a company that was actually born in the Summer Global Solutions Program of Singularity University. One of the co-founders is actually Greek, and this company has gone on to develop an incredible microfluidics platform for early detection of cancer. So have hope, we are coming up with incredible new diagnostics that are cheap, easy, faster, almost the definition that Vivian gave for AI. Now this all brings me to this point. What do all these diagnostics give us? They give us access, access in an unprecedented way, things we never had before. Now remember I told you that there is a dearth of medical personnel, medical expertise. And let's go back to space. So one of the things that I'm part of is a consortium in which we do trauma simulations in space. And we did a trauma simulation, a rescue for a Mars mission. And what we did was we simulated people being in different locations. So we worked with France, the Concordia base in Antarctica, and in California, in Silicon Valley. And we actually helped someone go through a rescue trauma stabilization scenario in the Mars Desert Research Station in Utah. And we learned a lot of amazing lessons about how to do telemedicine and telehealth through these scenarios. But there's also another problem, and you can see that on this slide. 2010, a Harvard Public School survey found that about one-third of the Earth's population doesn't have access to basic surgical services. And it's because they don't have access either to those surgical tools or to hospitals. And that's a supply chain problem, right? I mean, when you're thinking about something like healthcare, you need to think about it in the broader context of all these other technologies. So what can we do to improve supply chain? So I'm still on my space analogy, so here's a good one. 3D printing in space. How many of you have heard of this company, Made in Space? How many of you realize that there is a 3D printer on the International Space Station? Did you know that? There's just a few of you. I can see your, your hands going up in the audience. This is another company that was born at Singularity University. What did they do? They launched a 3D printer in space so they could print parts on demand. And guess what some of those parts could be? We could 3D print our medical tools in space as we need them. You need a scalpel? Print it in space. You need a retractor? Print it on demand. And for those of you who are saying, yeah, OK, remote medicine, supply chain, what do you do in countries where they don't have enough resources or energy? Well, you can solar power your 3D printers. You can solar power them. And in fact, my very close friend, Dara Dots, who is also affiliated with Singularity University, founded this company, Field Ready. So what does Field Ready do? It brings 3D printers into disaster areas and it leaves those 3D printers with local people. So this is an example from the earthquake in Haiti. And what they did was they were really lacking supplies to help people, so they teach them how to build CAD files. They give them the very, very cheap reagents they need, the plastics they need to print the supplies they're missing. And so and here's an example. Does anybody recognize this? Has anybody? been to the hospital for delivery of a baby? This is an umbilical cord clamp. Do you realize that they were missing umbilical cord clamps after the earthquake? So how were they going to safely deliver babies? They couldn't get these from China any longer. There was no supply chain to bring it to them. And instead, they learned how to build the CAD files. And these could be now printed on demand for every birth for about 30 cents US. Incredibly cheap. Here's another example. So Field Ready went into Nepal, and they were able to build parts that were missing for nebulizers for people with asthma. In this case, there was a very expensive incubator that had broken, and those incubators were necessary for prematurely born babies, little neonates, so that they could survive the first week of life. And so they built a CAD file to reproduce the clamp that was broken, and 23 babies' lives were saved 
with a couple of US dollars worth of plastic. And that incubator cost, if they had bought a new one, over $20,000. Now, supply chain is not just about bringing product to you that you can print, say, on demand. You saw this example yesterday in Ramez's talk about life-saving drones. This is Zipline. And what Zipline did was they learned that you could, on demand, do you know that they use WhatsApp? They basically WhatsApp each other and say, hey, there is a maternal hemorrhage in this hospital. And they were able to send the text message and get the blood on a drone to the hospital where the mother was losing blood, sometimes with a less than 10-minute turnaround. And they never just saved one life. They didn't just save the mother's life. They would save the baby's life, too. So that was a two for one. Now, they're not the only health care delivery drone company. In fact, another one was built at Singularity during one of our summer programs. And it was built by another Greek entrepreneur. He built a company called Matternet. And just this summer, they got this huge $14 million investment from Boeing. And again, the idea is you are missing something, whether it's a pharmaceutical, whether it's blood, whether it's a vaccine. We will bypass all the places that don't have adequate roads. We will fly that to you. Now, I've been talking again about bringing supplies to a location. What are some of the ways in which we can actually bring medical expertise back to those who need it? So enter the robots, right? So we can actually bring telepresence of our doctors to places where they actually need to bring that expertise. Or we can do what we do in space, right? We can take things like a digital stethoscope, we can image the heart, and we can send that signal back to Earth. Which brings me to the next technology, wearables and insidables. And in fact, do you, does anybody remember this? A Holter monitor? Has anybody ever worn one of these? Raise your hand if you have. I, I, I have. I actually, the one time I wore this is actually when I was interviewing for astronaut selection. And they wanted to watch our heart and monitor it for two days. And so they brought me into a room, and they actually scraped all my skin. They shaved my chest. I didn't really see any hair there, but they shaved my chest wall. And then they put alcohol in it. That was very, very painful. And then they sent me home and told me I couldn't take a shower. That's the original wearable device. So we now have something that's like a Band-Aid. You can wear it over your heart. You can shower. You can wear it for up to a week. And it will continuously monitor your heart. And this Zeo patch has actually produced more data in a few years than we have ever had in terms of having a repository of heart rate and heart rhythm data on this planet. And that database is being analyzed now through machine learning. And you've seen a few people measure, uh, talking about this movement to measure and quantify ourselves. OK, you guys have all heard about Fitbits and little things you can wear on your ankles, and even maybe some brain sensing technology. Um, what about your underwear? So, so this company, <laughs> it might sound kind of creepy, but they're actually weaving sensors, sensors into textiles. They're building ways to weave fabric that contains all of these sensors that can measure your biometrics. And they're actually bi-directional. Why are they doing that? Because, well, hopefully, everybody wears underwear, right? It's, everyone in this room is hopefully wearing some form of underwear, maybe a bra. I don't know, but this is a great way to actually collect data from people on a regular basis. What's another way to continuously collect data? Well, we can turn our home into basically a wearable sensor device, right? And in fact, the new hospitals of the future may very well be our homes. We may not have to send our elderly to die in hospitals. We can monitor them safely in their home, which will become the new hub of healthcare. Our sensors are now also developing force and haptic feedback to give us a sense of touch, pressure, and force in the world. 
Our sensors are also getting sophisticated enough that they can do things like this contact lens, which Google had been developing. They eventually abandoned it, but the idea was, wow, you can get a lot of information in your tears. And so this device, this contact lens, was there to actually measure excretion of things like glucose and salts within your tears and analyze them. So this didn't come to fruition, but they did develop a continuous glucose sensing device, which you see in this photograph here, which is going to change life for diabetics. I mean, you heard Vivian's story about monitoring her son. There are now seven companies that are racing to do this. This is a little bit invasive, non-invasively, and I will tell each and every one of you, all of those people in the audience who have tried to figure out what diet they should eat, how to control their blood sugar, how to live longer, continuous glucose monitoring may very well be the biomarker that will preserve your life. And it might be something that we end up all taking advantage of in the next two to three years. Here's another kind of sensor, and these are really incredible. These are devices that you can see through the body, and they're piezoelectric. What does that mean? A piezoelectric device can actually take energy from one form and transmute it into another. So you can actually have this device in the body, let's say it's on a nerve, and you can send sound waves into the body from the outside without cutting a person open, and those pressure waves will get turned into an electrical signal on the inside. And talk about sensing. There are a whole new array of sweat sensors being developed. This company, Ecrine, is actually measuring cortisol levels, so your stress hormone, within your sweat to help the U.S. Air Force monitor the cognitive status of their soldiers. Now, there's another form factor that sensors and wearables can come in. So this Chicago-based company was concerned about conditions like this. There are many places in the world where, again, under-resourced for medical personnel. And when you're dealing with things like babies, that's incredibly difficult because there are a lot of lives lost if you can't monitor those babies appropriately. So what did they do? Any of you um, been in the hospital when a baby was born? Raise your hands. You know how we take the baby and we wrap it immediately in this blanket, like a little burrito or maybe a dolma? And then, and then we put a cap on them, right, to keep their little heads warm. Guess what? That cap is an opportunity. You can surround that cap with sensors that can actually sense the baby's vital signs. And now all these babies can be simultaneously monitored on a dashboard that is actually sent to a series of healthcare givers, maybe only one, who can monitor up to 30 children at a time to make sure none of them die. Now, wearables don't just have to sense. Wearables can actually do things. This is an incredible company that's been founded by a colleague of mine in Australia. And what you see in that little Petri dish are a series of very, very small devices that actually have a bunch of needles embedded on them. Now, in this diagram, what you can see is that these needles are very, very short. And what do they contain? This is a new delivery mechanism for vaccines. And these needles are so short that they go into a layer of the skin that is not served by a lot of nerve endings. So unlike the usual vaccine, which is quite painful to get, you can actually deliver a vaccine to someone that doesn't hurt. And because of the exact location that those needles embed themselves in the skin, there are a series of cells that you see in the photograph called antigen-presenting cells. And they put up their dendrites and they collect this vaccine and you can, because they're so efficient, use one one hundred fiftieth the dose of a normal vaccine. And this is now being deployed in the developing world because it costs pennies, pennies to deliver these vaccines. So the next topic that we're going to cover is mixed reality. Now, we saw an amazing talk yesterday by Jody about the potential of mixed augmented reality. And it, it's big everywhere. In fact, Athens is a hub for a lot of different virtual and mixed reality experiences. 
And even in my own field, we are using augmented reality in order to train for things like trauma simulations. Now, a very good friend of mine, Dr. Shafi Ahmad in the UK, is actually using virtual reality to do something different. He's doing medical education. And when he is in the operating room, what he does is he actually streams the operation to the outside world, to other students who need to learn the operation, and they can actually watch it in real time using the simplest cardboard Google Glass. Now, I truly believe that if we don't have enough medical students we are training all over the world, that the future of medical training is going to come from mixed reality. So I want to show you a video, and this is by a colleague of mine who's at Stanford. He's a pediatric cardiologist. In other words, he takes care of babies with heart disease from birth. And these babies have very, very complicated hearts. They're born with the vessels wired in the wrong places. And it's very difficult to teach students how to understand that kind of tricky heart anatomy. So take a look at this video. Hi, I'm Dr. David Axelrod, a pediatric cardiologist at Stanford. And we're taking medical education to a whole new level. Medical trainees will be able to see and touch a living, beating heart right in front of them. So they will be able to have a whole new take on how to learn about the heart. We're starting with congenital heart disease, which are structural defects of the heart that people are born with. They'll be able to actually go inside the heart to see the difference between a normal heart and a structurally abnormal heart with congenital heart disease. Our virtual heart goes so far beyond what textbooks, plastic models, and even cadavers have taught medical trainees for decades. It gives them a vivid, three-dimensional sense of how the heart works and what happens when it's not working normally. So if I were a medical student and I was at medical school and that was the way I was learning, oh my god, I would have loved medical school so much more. Now, a company that's really trying to build on augmented reality in terms of training students is actually Microsoft HoloLens. And what you're going to see in this video is a teacher that's actually taking students through anatomy by taking the body and in real time, breaking it apart into its many layers. And now what you see in this clip is the teacher is teaching about a fracture in the humerus bone. And the students can actually see the fracture in three dimensions. They can walk around it. They can understand anatomy in a way that is impossible to do in a textbook, and that you literally can only use cadavers for. Cadavers which are difficult to get, expensive, and honestly, there are ethical issues with them. So medical education is completely going to be transformed by this new technology. And it's not going to be just transformed for those of us in the medical profession. But you can now get an Oculus Go device, which is a self-contained virtual reality system. You don't need a fancy computer with a high-powered graphics card for about 200 US dollars. And that means that all of you sitting in the audience can actually start training and learning about your own anatomy, learning about the world in ways you never expected to do. This is something that's going to be accessible to all of us from the comfort of our homes. So our next topic, genomics. <laughs> this, this is a big one, because this is, this is actually changing society at a very fundamental level. So within Greece, there are a number of academic genetic centers, places that actually study human genetics and are involved in rapid sequencing of genomes. And I hope that one of the things that you've learned is that genome sequencing, that, and that is one of the things it accelerated so rapidly and became so cheap so fast that it actually beat Moore's Law. Now, Greece has actually joined an EU initiative that is called the Genomics Declaration. And the idea here is that the entire EU is getting together to sequence at least a million genomes within about four to five years and share them across borders. But there's something else on the genomics horizon. So how many of you have heard of CRISPR? Anybody heard of CRISPR? OK, so I see. About 20% of you. OK. CRISPR is a technology that is going to change everything. It's going to change humanity as we know it. 
CRISPR is something that we actually stole from bacteria, bacteria that were being invaded by viruses. And what those bacteria have is an enzyme that allows them to recognize the virus, go in, find the DNA of that virus, and chop it up so that the virus dies. That's basically their immune response to viral invasion, so they don't get infections. What this enzyme does is, for those of you who do word processing, which is probably everyone in this room, imagine the command F on your keyboard, the find function. What you do is you search for the, the letter code in the DNA that you're looking for, the spelling you're looking to change. And then what you can do is you can use a command C and cut, or command X, I should say, and cut that letter code in a very specified position. And then we could use other kinds of trickery to use the command V function or to paste in the correction. OK, but this isn't word processing. This is DNA processing. We can take the code of life, and we can now cut out defects in our DNA that cause human disease and repair them. OK? And we're doing it at multiple levels and on multiple kinds of diseases that have a genetic basis. The first human clinical trials for sickle cell disease and actually for modifying your immune system to, to kill cancer are taking place as we speak in humans. One of the issues that's going to come up, and I don't know how many of you are thinking about it, is what happens when we start editing the DNA in our germline, that is, the sperm and the egg? What if you want kids who are incredibly brilliant? Can you edit your children's DNA to produce them? That this is something that the entire world has agreed for now we shouldn't be doing, but I'm fairly certain that there are countries that are actually doing it in sort of a black market-like way. Now, I said CRISPR is going to change the world. We're not just treating human diseases. We are actually modifying other organisms to take out viruses. For instance, in pigs, which would have been a source of organs, we have an organ shortage for transplant. You can actually edit the DNA of viruses in pigs so that they no longer, those organs, when they're transplanted, kill the person who is the human recipient. So this may actually help us with our organ shortage. Now, CRISPR has become a big thing because we don't just edit the DNA of humans or animals. We're now editing the DNA of plants, for instance, for our food supply. So this has become a controversial issue. And I don't know how many of you are aware of this, but there have been experiments done now to modify the DNA of mosquitoes so that they can no longer reproduce, so they become sterile. And there's been a huge discussion about this because this would eradicate a lot of the world's diseases that are carried by mosquito-borne vectors. But the United Nations has just discussed having a test ban on these evolution-warping gene drives. Right? So lots and lots of ethical issues, right? Are we going to modify the environment? Are we going to start a eugenics program to create designer babies? Just something to think about. This is really on the horizon, and this will change your entire world within the next five to 10 years. So I bring you to stem cells and regenerative medicine. Stem cells are basically the cells in your body and they were especially present when you were born, when you were a young fetus, these cells rapidly divide, and they have the potential to become almost anything in your body. Right? So that sounds great, because if we can get those stem cells again, we can actually put them back into bodies that are breaking down. We can put them back into bodies that have diseases. And in fact, it turns out that there is no real specific law that regulates the use of stem cells in Greece. That was actually very interesting to me. And it's why Greece has got a very healthy medical tourism industry around stem cell treatment. Now, there are other ways to get stem cells where countries who are, for instance, very Catholic might have an issue, because fetuses are one of the best ways to get them. So why don't we bypass that ethical issue? 
So this company, Cellularity, which was actually co-founded by Peter Diamandis, this company actually harvests stem cells that are present in the placenta, right? So all babies that are born have a placenta, and they are a rich supply of these cells that can become anything. So what an amazing idea. Let's bank those cells to treat human diseases. Now in Greece, you're also banking adult stem cells, and that is something that's actually taking place all over the world. There's also another company in Greece that is heavily involved in regenerative medicine. In other words, taking those stem cells and doing useful things, trying to build back or restore function to bodies that have lost them. But one of the most interesting innovations in stem cell technology has come from the fact that we now can take mature adult cells and revert them to their stem cell state. These are called induced pluripotent stem cells. And you can take them from skin, you can take them from fat, you can put them in a dish, and you can basically engineer them so they go back in time and they can become anything. Here you see an example from a group at Stanford that's been doing research into people that have a defect in a gene in their heart. And what you see there on the top row of your screen is normal heart muscle. It's a cross-section of normal heart muscle. And you can see that it's arrayed beautifully. It almost looks like the rings of a tree. So it has this repeating structure. But underneath it, you see the heart tissue from somebody who has this particular gene defect. What they were able to do was take those heart cells put them in a dish, revert their state, and actually watch how they beat in a dish. And now they can trial drugs on a per-patient basis to see what's going to work for them. Here's the other thing you can do. You can do CRISPR on these stem cells. That's becoming a verb now, by the way, that, you know, command F, find, cut, replace function. You can CRISPR the induced stem cells from a person that has a genetic disease and hopefully transplant them back to that person and they won't reject them. And we're beginning to move these first therapies using induced pluripotent stem cells in multiple clinical trials. And again, this stuff is really recent. It's hot off the presses. Just last week, the very first induced stem cells were implanted into a patient with Parkinson's disease. So we may see stem cells helping things like Parkinson's, stroke, Alzheimer's disease. Now, here's another really interesting um, device that's actually in clinical trials right now. This is a spray gun. And what this gun does is, let's say you go to the emergency room and you have a huge wound or you have a burn, what they can do now is take your skin cells, put them in a dish, revert them back to their state, load up your own cells into the gun, and then spray them on your wound so that your skin grows back without a scar. Okay, so that's what this, this gun does. Now, regenerative medicine is getting really, really clever. So take a look at the title of this next slide. And this is not a joke. So recently at Exponential Medicine, so that just happened a couple of weeks ago, Andrew Pelling, who's a Canadian scientist, came to Exponential Medicine and he talked to us about using vegetables to grow organs. What is that about? Well, it turns out all that fibrous stuff, let's say you take a bite of an apple and that stuff that doesn't really get easily digested in your system, that fibrous stuff makes really great scaffolding. It makes the structure that you can grow things on. You can take an apple, carve it into the shape of an ear, put it back onto someone who, say, lost an ear, doesn't have an ear, and their cells will grow back in and populate that scaffolding and grow them a new ear. And you don't reject it because the cellulose doesn't cause an immune reaction and the human recipient. He told me the other night he was eating dinner and he looked at his asparagus and he thought, oh, I could build a spinal cord from this, right? <laughs> I, he's not kidding though. I mean, this is the great thing about Andrew, he's not kidding. 
the last thing I want to introduce you to in this idea of regenerative medicine is what about the end, okay? How many of you are interested in cryopreservation, right? So freezing yourself so we can unfreeze you at a certain point. So let me see a show of hands. All right, you've been at Singularity for two days. Okay, there, there's a few, there's a few. Okay, if you freeze yourself, I'm going to warn you, and there are, there are three companies doing this. Look, since the 1980s, the end of the 80s, people have actually been putting down payments or actually sticking themselves into vats, okay? This is a cryopreservation graph. But what happens if I thaw you and like the ice cream that you put into the freezer, took out and put back in, it, your brain is just full of ice crystals. You will be dumber, you will be dumber than you were before you got frozen, if you survive at all, right? So guess what? There are companies that are actually working on the freeze-thaw process for brains just for this very reason. Now, one of these companies went to a major accelerator in the Bay Area, in California, just this year, called Y Combinator. And the head of Y Combinator, Sam Altman, has put a $10,000 payment down with this company to have his brain frozen and thawed. All right, so that, that's a, it's definitely a vote of confidence, right? You know, voting with your money, voting with your brain. <laughs> now, I had shown you a couple of examples of 3D printing for supply chain and medicine. I am now going to show you some 3D printing examples for regenerative medicine, right? So the idea here is, could we print organs, right? That is the holy grail. We don't know quite how to print large organs yet. But I am going to tell you with everything that you have now learned, for instance, stem cells, what if I told you that instead of using plastic for ink, we can use all sorts of things, including your own stem cells. So this group in Australia has basically taken, whoops, let me see if I can go back. Can you help me go back a slide? Okay. Okay, so this group in Australia has taken stem cells for cartilage, and what you see them doing is using a pen, and they can make a tiny little hole in your knee, and they can paint in the cartilage, cross-link it under UV light, and regenerate the cartilage you've lost due to arthritis with the equivalent of something that's not even an invasive surgery. You can use a little numbing medicine for this, right? Now, this company, Reginova, is also trying to build hearts in a dish. You can see how they've used induced pluripotent stem cells, and they put them in a dish. The, the cells have divided, they've assembled, and they've created a beating heart structure. We are now finding people who are building, using 3D printing, eyes, they're building ears, they're building bladders, they're building kidneys. Here's an example of a robot with six degrees of freedom. Uh, again, we've gone too far. There we go. And you'll see that it's actually painting out a heart valve. So for people who need valve replacements, and a lot of these people, when the valve is replaced, it's not the exact shape of their own heart, and they end up leaking. Well, we can just 3D image your heart now, and we can build you a custom heart valve that we can actually implant that your body won't reject. And here's an incredibly clever example of what you can do with 3D printing. You remember those babies I told you with really complicated anatomy that are born with heart disease? It used to take sometimes four or five surgeries to correct the defects in their hearts because they were so complicated and we, they couldn't even figure out exactly what to do with these babies until they got inside to look. They're now building 3D models of these babies' hearts they're practicing surgery on them. And then when they go in, they can, they can fix that baby's heart with one single surgery. And one of the most amazing examples of 3D printing and regenerative medicine is this. And this is kind of an uncomfortable slide. What you see on the left is a firefighter who went in to save people, and his face essentially melted. And he's been going through life like this. And what happened was, 
a group of surgeons at New York University actually modeled his face in three dimensions, rebuilt him ear canals, rebuilt what the skull ought to look like, and then they 3D printed all the models as scaffolds to build him a new face and give him a face transplant from another donor. And if that sounds kind of bizarre, remember I told you the secret is the ink? Here's a paper that got published very recently in Nature. What did they do here? Instead of using stem cells, they used bacteria as the ink. Bacteria secrete, secrete all sorts of substances that can be very useful. And in this case, they use bacteria that secrete cellulose, the same thing that were in the apples. And what they do is they spray the bacteria over different models, so you see one on a doll's face, and they allow it to cross-link. They dissolve away and kill the bacteria, and now they can peel away that cellulose and use it for a face transplant, okay? So we're now printing the actual scaffolding materials using bacteria from a 3D printer for face transplants, you know, just in a day's work. So we're getting to the end here, and a few of the most amazing places to talk about are this, robotics and bionics. You heard a little bit about this yesterday. This is robotic surgery, intuitive surgical. So our robots can help us now with surgery. This, I think you even saw a video of this. This is a robot that's actually lifting someone so a human doesn't have to do it. Here's a robot companion that's actually reminding an elderly person to take their medications. This is a robot companion. Aren't they kind of cutesy? Like, the Japanese build a lot of these, right? And they're built with Japanese sensibilities. Um, but robotics and bionics can do some other really interesting things. So basically, if you have an amputee, right, who's got a stump, you can use a phone, you can 3D image that stump, and then for a few hundred US bucks, through open bionics, you can 3D print them a custom limb. Now, if you want to get a little more expensive, you can go to this guy. This is Hugh Hare, a professor of bioengineering at MIT. And he lost both of his legs, I hope you can appreciate this, in a climbing accident when he was very young. So what he did was he built custom bionics for himself. And he has an entire company now dedicated to creating custom bionics that help different people walk, run, dance, rock climb, actually better than they used to with two normal limbs. He calls this neuro-embodied design. And other kinds of limbs are being funded. This is a DARPA-funded limb where somebody who's lost an arm actually has a connection to the arm with a brain-machine interface. And they are basically talking to the arm, directing it with their mind, and getting feedback. So see this very short video. There is sound on this. Well, I hope you appreciate it, even though the sound didn't come on, that you actually have this robotic arm that's picking up very delicate objects, right? It's being controlled by the mind, and it's not breaking things down like the grapes or these eggs. And the most amazing example of this is actually a brain-machine interface that was developed by this group, the BrainGate 2 Consortium. I believe Vivian might have mentioned this yesterday at the end of her AI talk when she was talking about closed-loop AIs. Now, what you're going to see here is a quadriplegic, okay? And these people are basically paralyzed from the neck down. But they can think, they can plan, they want to move. And so what happens is, they have these electrode arrays that are actually implanted in their motor cortex. Look how small, size of a pill. And what it does is it intercepts the planning thoughts coming from the front of the brain, sends them to a machine, an algorithm is run to decode their thoughts. You see this guy opening his email using his thoughts alone. He's opening his email and he's typing using his thoughts. And this is the video she told you to Google. This is a woman who's actually using her mind to actually tell a robotic arm to bring her a carafe of coffee. So for those of you who didn't do your homework last night and Google the video, this is the video, right? Imagine what the, do you realize what I just showed you? Someone, these are people who are controlling actuators in the real world using their thoughts alone. And what if you could connect this up to 
a spinal cord instead of a robotic arm. And that's what you see with these paralyzed monkeys. The motor decoder, instead of having the signal sent out to the outside world, are being sent back in to stimulate the spinal cord. So here's a monkey dragging their paralyzed leg, but when the stimulator is on, they walk normally. And let me remind you again, this is a brain-machine interface implanted into their motor cortex that is receiving the thoughts of this monkey that wants to move but couldn't move before. Now, these involve invasive brain surgery, and what we're finding now is you can deploy brain-machine interfaces non-invasively. For instance, you can make a tiny little slit in the groin, and you can actually send a brain-machine interface through the groin, something that looks like this, it follows the vein, and it ends up going into the vein in a brain over the motor strip. So you can deploy brain-machine interfaces without invasive brain surgery any longer. What's more, how many of you would actually submit to having your brain stimulated to get smarter? Any show of hands? Okay, there's a lot of people on this one. Do you realize that you can actually stimulate the nerve that runs along your neck? and actually increase plasticity, that's the ability to acquire new knowledge. Now, we used to do this kind of stuff with implants, but we can now use things like magnetism and electricity and ultrasound from the outside to stimulate brains on the inside and improve memory. This study looked at people doing math problems, and they not only found that they improved in math, but they found that the effect lasted for at least six months. What would happen if I made everybody in this audience that much smarter? And finally, in this topic of brains, just a few days ago, it was announced that people were actually building baby brains in a dish. Okay, I'm saying that we're building human brains and growing them in a dish, and they are now assembling showing electrical activity like human brains, and they are comparing these little organoids, these brain organoids, to premature baby brains. And they're using them now to study things like epilepsy. But, but, if you let that thing grow up enough, is it going to grow into an organic brain? And would that brain express that thing that you consider to be consciousness, right? So consciousness in a dish, what does that mean? And finally, so we close with this, artificial intelligence. Again, XPRIZE. There is now an IBM Watson XPRIZE for artificial intelligence for good, and the category that has the most teams that have applied is actually for health and well-being. We're using AIs now to interact with people who are depressed to act as their therapists. We're attaching AIs to the back ends of smartphones to do things like diagnose cervical cancer in rural clinics in Africa. This is what Vivian was just referring to in her talk, machine learning algorithms that are eventually going to replace human doctors with some of their skill sets. So this is an algorithm that can actually detect a cancer nodule in a patient on an x-ray with higher accuracy than a human radiologist can. And there is another convolutional neural network that has been used to actually diagnose heart arrhythmias. Both of these come out of the machine learning group at Stanford. But AI is not just being used for those kinds of data sets. Google has now deployed a new AI algorithm that can look for heart disease before it actually manifests in your heart by looking at the back of your eye through your retina completely non-invasively. And we're using AI for drug discovery as well. You can actually screen an entire bank of molecules and look to see the lock and key mechanism. And in this case, this group, AdamNet, has actually been able to find a potential drug candidate for Ebola. So that means that there are huge entrepreneurs that are actually trying to beat AI. They're trying to increase human potential by creating invasive human brain machine interfaces. So that was Elon Musk and Neuralink. Brian Johnson with Kernel, I mean, his goal is essentially to say that we shouldn't just be considering AI. What he said to me at the last conference was, we should be as ambitious about our own human potential, let's talk about the last talk, as we are about artificial intelligence. 
So let's close and think about this. We have spoken about new trends in access, right? Everything from bringing medical expertise to actually creating new kinds of wearable sensors in different form factors, to using drones for delivery in your supply chain, and potentially for creating new robotic expertise. But I have hopefully also introduced you to a number of the ethical issues. I haven't even talked to you about this, but we can actually now create false memories in brains by moving a memory from one living organism from their organic brain, we can inject it into another brain, and that brain and that organism will behave like the memory was theirs. We can take the bionics and the exoskeletons I've been telling you about that we use for paralyzed people, and we can create races of super soldiers. We are also potentially in a domain where we're going to create a race of haves and have-nots if we're not careful about democratization. Personalized medicine costs a lot of money. And we're getting to the point where we can engineer the human race. And that brings up a whole other host of ethical issues. There are data privacy issues in everything I've mentioned. So many of these algorithms, actually, are being deployed in places like China, where they can actually do minority report, like trying to predict who's going to commit a crime before they actually do. You'll see a little bit more of this in Alex Gladstein's talk later. But the devices we implant in ourselves, even for medical benefit, like our pacemakers, can be hacked. Our insulin pumps can be hacked. Hackers have now been able to actually detect people's passwords when they're wearing a passive EEG device and typing in a password. And machine learning classifiers can actually detect if you have a mental disorder, and this, this study looked for alcoholism, even if you don't drink. They can look at your brain waves and figure out what might be wrong with you. And how would that information be used against you? So I leave you with this idea <clears throat> that what we do now, the future of healthcare in both Greece and around the world is going to involve actually educating our children, preserving their beginner mindset, and allowing them to explore new and innovative solutions. And all of you here, all of you empowered people, need to be investing in these new and disruptive solutions. And there is a history of entrepreneurship here in Greece. And you need to harness that to come up with the kinds of disruptions that's actually going to move medicine forward so that we can build the new companies of the future and we can take people, take care of individual people, communities, and our entire planet. Thank you so much.